Okay, so this is our Simone Doan reading group, continuing our reading of imagination and invention. We're picking up <clears throat> from the top of page 80 uh, in the English translation. Um, so we're in part two, we're looking at the role of the image in the encounter with the object. So the image as simultaneous with the object, as opposed to in part one, we looked at the image prior to the encounter with the object. Um, and so we looked at... Um, uh, one of the sort of the main part that we read last week was um, part uh, or section B of part two. So the role of the interperceptual image in information gathering. Uh, and so we'll finish that part today uh, and we'll continue the, to section C. Um, so what we're, we looked at uh, was um, the concept of perceptual constancy that Simon Don um, discusses briefly. Uh, and we looked at some examples of this. So, for example, there's color constancy in visual perception. Uh, you take a, a sheet of white paper and you look at it under sunlight, it looks white, and then you look at it under electric light, um, which has a different a sort of um, spectrum of, of light, uh, but the paper still looks white. So even though the actual spectrum of light that reaches your retina uh, is very different in the two sort of illumination contexts, you you still perceive the paper as white. You see, you uh, the color that you perceive is constant, even though the um, illumination and the light reflected onto your retina is varying in the different situations. And this, so co this color constancy is just one example of uh, perceptual constancy. We also have um, various forms of size uh, constancy, constancy. So if you see a person from up close or you see a person from far away, you still see them as like person size. You don't see the, even like the, the person you see from far away, they're, image um, on your retina is obviously much smaller than when you see them close up, but you don't see them as like a tiny person. You see them as a regular sized person far away. Um, uh, but then he also mentioned some of the limits of this constancy so that uh, when you see an object in unfamiliar settings, sometimes it looks uh, bigger than usual or smaller than usual, depending on what the um, uh, what the sort of context is. So he talks about um, uh, like chimney a chimney um, on the roof looks like sort of normal size, but then if you have a chimney sitting in the staircase of your house, it suddenly looks like this huge, weird object. Um, uh, and then he talks about um, how during the war, during World War II, presumably is what he's talking about, um, you had uh, houses that were sort of blown open by bombs, and you had household objects just sitting out on the street or uh, open in the open air, and they look small and sort of um, dirty and and strangely colored and so on. Um, so these are sort of limits to the constancy of uh, uh, perception. Uh, but the whole point, like the sort of function of perceptual constancy is to sort of, um, uh, is, is not just to sort of preserve these invariants, uh, but it allows us to um, perceive differences that are important. So the sheet of paper seen under sunlight and seen under electric light has uh, the same perceived color because the properties of the sheet of paper are uh, more or less the same like in either context. We don't really care about the difference. Uh, we can sort of abstract away from the difference in terms of the light spectrum that is reflected onto our retina uh, and then we can just treat the paper as having the same properties in these two contexts. Um, but then this sort of perceptual constancy means that we can also um, detect differences that are worth paying attention to. Um, they aren't sort of masked by all these uh, other differences that have to do with changes of context. So if the, if the sheet of paper did change color, um, if you know, the, the white paper became blue, for example, um, then that would be something noteworthy. That would be something that would stand out um, even apart from changes in illumination. Uh, and then you would say, okay, this paper has actually undergone some sort of physical transformation and it's not just appearing in a different context. So this uh, perceptual constancy has the function of sort of um, hiding the differences that that don't matter and allowing the differences that do matter to stand out. Uh, and so that's um, sort of the uh, the next bit that we, we looked at um, in, in subsection two uh, is that differential perception. So um, Simon Don talks about this sort of expert perception. Uh, so like a mountaineer, for example, 
um, will have a sort of intuitive sense that, uh, say, an avalanche is about to happen or, or um, uh, an expert skier might, you know, be able to detect just from the way the, the snow looks, whether it's, like, safe to ski down this slope or not, uh, uh, or, or whether it's uh, not safe to ski down this other slope. Um, and, you know, this is a kind of perception that um, would be very hard to sort of articulate in explicit terms, like, uh, you, it would be very difficult to write a textbook of like, this is exactly what sort of things to look for um, to detect whether an avalanche is about to happen. Uh, it, it sort of requires this experienced uh, or experiential learning. Like you have to really, you know, live through the experience of um, uh, being in this environment. And um, you, you sort of get this intuitive sense that an avalanche is about to happen. Uh, and it, and you might not be able to even explain like what is it what um, aspects of the environment uh, is it that you're seeing or experiencing that leads you to think that there is going to be an avalanche. Uh, and another example that he gave was um, a mother who uh, sort of intuitively senses that her child is sick, um, and you know she might realize this before the child even knows that anything is wrong, and uh, the doctor might not be able to detect anything because the doctor is not. Uh, familiar with this child, but the mother has an everyday experience of, you know, what the child's behavior is like and um, sort of knows that something is off before anyone else can detect anything different. Uh, and so this kind of perception, uh, this sort of um, differential uh, intuitive experience uh, means that you um, sort of detect differences from the baseline or the normal behavior or the normal um, uh, appearance of an object of some kind and you you notice when something is different uh and so this is sort of the the second stage or the second um aspect of this perception after the uh perceptual constancy so you have to um have that perceptual constancy as a sort of foundation on which you can um build this experience of a difference um and so this is a kind of um expert knowledge, but it's a it's a particular kind of expert knowledge that is not um, sort of explicitly um, um, teachable. It's something you have to learn through experience. So you can't, uh, again, it's, it's not something you can write in a textbook, or at least it's very difficult to explain in a textbook, you know, um, what exactly it looks like when a certain child is sick. Um, it's uh, it's something that you have to learn through experience. So these are sort of two different kinds of expert knowledge, like the kind that, say, a doctor has is a kind of expert knowledge that involves learning lots of facts and theories and uh, uh, sort of the relations between facts and so on. And these are all things that you can write in a textbook, um, you know, what sort of chemical composition different um, medications have and how they act on the body and so on. Um, but then this kind of knowledge is um, distinct from the the knowledge that the mother has of you know how her child is is doing whether the child is sick or not, um, which is not something that is uh, easily describable in a textbook. Uh, so that's sort of like the the test or the criterion we can use to distinguish these two types of knowledge. Like, is it something you can explain to someone in words, or is it something that you have to sort of learn uh, through your own experience? Um, right, and and this. This sort of knowledge, uh, this experiential knowledge, Simon Dome describes it as um, uh, having this differential image character. So there's a sort of image of your, of, you know, the mother has an image of her child of like what her child is normally like. Um, but it's a, it's a very strange sort of image because um, you can't necessarily sort of recall this image to yourself and, and just sort of contemplate the image in, in a sort of speculative sense. Uh, it's an image that only really uh, appears in use. Uh, so another example that Simon Dong gives is the the shepherd who um, who can look at his flock and just see immediately. Oh, there's a, a sheep missing, or there's uh, you know something's wrong. I don't see the flock doesn't look like it should. Uh, but that doesn't mean the shepherd can sort of recall this image of his flock and count the sheep in the image. Um, it's 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 only in the actual perception in this encounter with the object that the shepherd can sort of uh, compare the the image with the uh, perceived reality and say that there's something different or there's a, an incompatibility of these two, um, these two um, perceptions. 
So yeah, it's, a, it's an image that only ever appears in the encounter with the object. You can't sort of voluntarily recall it and um, you know, uh, perceive what properties this image has, um, you know, what, how many objects there are and what shape the different objects have in your image. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's only ever perceived in the encounter with the object. Okay, um, so yeah, let's go on to um, subsection three. If I can get someone to read from, yeah, the, uh, yeah, just the whole of subsection three up to the section break on uh, page 81. I can read. Subsection three, the role of the image in adaptation to change. Perception of derivation. During the course of perception itself, we can observe the focusing of the receptive activity when data brought by incident signals display regularity. For instance, a law of iterative recurrence. In this case, after a few seconds of adaptation, the continuous rhythms and variations become components of the reception system of in incident signals. Uh, and only discrepancies from these models are actually perceived in the proper sense of the word, grasped as new and capable of triggering a new attitude or action in the subject. We might say that the internal image of rhythms and regularities neutralizes the signals as carriers of possible novelty as content of psychic reception. A whole set of phenomena of habits in the sense of quote-unquote habit as an adaptation that reduces the vigilance of perceptual events belongs to this genesis of neutralization models of perceptual events. One adapts to the regular passage of trains at night to the noise of machines, etc. By contrast, an irregularity in the regime of incident signals triggers a true psychic reception, whether it be a supernumerary event or a lack sufficiently strong to awaken a sleeping subject. We might also cite the old example of the tick-tock of a windmill. The efficacy of this subjective mask of incidences is such that when misperceived, it can create intense perceptual illusions in the experience of consecutive visual motion. If a striped belt or a disc bearing a spiral stops, it generates a subsequent effect of illusory movement going in reverse to the primary motion. Such an effect can occur on any background, a human face, for instance so long as it carries the lineaments or even a few details of a structure. In such a case, the internal image of the received movement, acting as a cinematic negative of perceptual events, is endowed with some inertia. Approximately 20 seconds are required to constitute it in full, and when the primary movement stops, the negative of external signals continues to act for several seconds. Since nothing balances it out, it generates through differential effect and derivation, 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 an illusory impression of reverse motion compared to the primary motion. The same images of regular incidents allow the reception of accelerations and decelerations as a new reality against the background of an already given motion. The perception in this case functions as a comparator that sends the derivation signals to the properly psychic reception. The image is yoked to incidences, but without a delay that is necessary and essential for the comparison to be affected. It is this delay that allows the image to emerge as a differential signal sent as illusion to the psychic reception when the variation of perceptual events is too rapid. A sudden stoppage of noises causes silence to be perceived as a truly positive signal in the form of, an, in the form of a noise-ending blow. Completely random events alone cannot be neutralized by the image as an auxiliary of perception. Um, so m maybe the last subsection was about how uh, once this perceptual constancy is obtained, differential perception can then um, sort of further determine the object of perception. And this subsection is about how that perceptual constancy uh, has its own, or I guess we already knew that it had a momentum, but this momentum is strong enough that when it's suddenly halted, it can create these illusions. Like when you look at a, a, a spinning disc and then it stops and things appear to be spinning the opposite direction. Yeah, I think... Um... I think this subsection is actually not so much about perceptual constancy. It's a it's a sort of next stage of um, 
differential perception uh, or differential per di or, sorry perception of derivation is what he calls it here is is what comes after um, differential perception. So first we have constancy. We perceive the the object as um, maintaining its properties in various situations, and then we have perception of uh, we have differential perception. We we detect uh, when the object actually has uh, properties that are different in some important sense, as opposed to just uh, changes of situation. And then the the third stage is being able to perceive changes uh, in uh, in the object. Um, and um, but we can also uh, like the change itself is something that you can uh, perceive as constant. Uh, so um, a, a sort of regular rhythmic um, change, you eventually, after even just a few seconds, you become habituated to this change and you perceive the change as constant. And then you can suddenly, if, if that change itself changes, if there's an acceleration or deceleration uh, or the change you know, comes to a complete stop, for example, then you perceive that change in the change, the sort of second order change, you perceive that as uh, something new. Um, so like the, the example that he gives with the spiral, I put a link in the, in the chat here if anyone wants to check this out. So if you have a, um, a spiral movement, uh, so you, you draw a spiral and you, you sort of uh, twirl it around and you stare at the center for 30 seconds or so, and then you look at a fixed image afterwards, then the fixed image seems to be spiraling in the opposite direction. Um, so you you have uh, habituated yourself over a few seconds to um, this spiraling movement, uh, and so then that spiraling movement gets perceived as constant. And then when you suddenly switch to the fixed image, um, it's as if the uh, the spiraling movement has stopped in reverse direction, and uh, and so that's sort of how the illusion arises. Um, and so. Yeah, so he, he mentions a couple of these different types of illusions that arise out of um, um, habituation to a certain rhythmic um, or constant type of motion. Uh, but there, there's also, so in addition to these illusions, there's also differential perception of uh, um, second order change. So he talks about um, how if you have a regular sound of, like, say you're... Um, your clock is ticking next to you, like a mechanical clock um, is ticking, and then it suddenly stops. You, like, as you're sitting there, you know, working at your desk or reading or whatever, the clock is ticking and you don't notice it. But then as soon as the clock stops, you suddenly notice the silence. Um, so the silence itself, sort of, if you abstract from the um, situation, silence, of course, is not something you can perceive. But because the silence appears suddenly, uh, out of the background of the ticking clock, you perceive the silence as a, a sort of positive absence. You you actually notice the silence, um, and um, yeah, so it, it's it's something that you can uh, um, experience uh, the absence of noise. Uh, and there's like a, a sort of well known um, example that I, someone doesn't bring up here, but I think he m might mention it in other places of like the you know you're watching someone a sick person um at night and you you might fall asleep um but then as soon as the sick person uh stops breathing or their breathing changes suddenly then you wake up and you um you sort of notice that there's been a change so the the regular breathing pattern you get habituated and it's it's uh sort of becomes a constant but then the change in that pattern whether it stops or you know becomes faster or whatever um that change itself is something that you perceive as a, you know, as a, a, a differential perception. Um, and, and so you, even if you were asleep, you might wake up and notice the difference in, in breathing pattern. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a, a sort of next step where change itself becomes constant and, uh, and then a change of change is something you can perceive. And this sort of reminded me of that, uh, in, Individuation Volume 1, that uh, really interesting section where he talks about immortality or life after death um, as the reversal of the sign of individuality. Um, and I wonder if this kind of, uh, this kind of, the same kind of uh, habituation to regularities um, and maybe even the expert 
knowledge discussed in the last section um, and the sudden cessation of the the presence of the individuality that gives you those impressions um, if we can see a similarity between like the way these optical illusions operate and the way that people live with the negative individuality of uh, someone they know who's passed away. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so in that that passage, um, for those who um, you know weren't here when we read the individuation, um, so in that passage, he talks about how there's this sort of uh, perception of the absence of an individual um, after they die. So uh, you you have an individual is always sort of complementary to a milieu to a, an, a surrounding environment, um, and then that environment sort of uh, has a hole in it, I guess you could say, after the individual dies. Um, and uh, so anyone who has experienced, uh, you know, someone that you're close to dying, you, you, you know, you see, uh, you know, this is the chair that they sat in, or th- this is the coffee mug that they used or whatever, you, you sort of experience the world uh, that they lived in as like um, missing that person. Um, and uh yeah so this this type of um habituation that Simon was describing here so this would be a, a longer term habituation not just like looking at a spiral for a few seconds but um over the span of months and years you become habituated to the presence of this person uh in your environment in, in the world that you share um and then so different elements of that world become sort of connected to that person uh, and then in the absence of that person, you have this sort of uh, negative perception of the like the, the person's absence is, is a is something that you actually perceive and not just a, a lack of a person. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a good um, a good way of connecting these two uh, parts of what Simon Dolan is talking about. Right. And Angus, I'll just put that in the chat for those who are um, here as we're uh, as we're discussing this. Sorry, I'm just looking for something uh, I wanted to share here. Um, uh, bear with me. Yeah, so this is, uh, um, for those who are in the chat here, um, there's a, a track um, that uses uh, silence. Um, so there's an effect called side chaining. Um, but anyway, that's, the details don't really matter. But uh, um, it uses silence uh, as a sort of percussion instrument, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but anyway, you can check that out later if you want. Um, all right, so let's go on to um, section C. Um, let me see how long. Yeah, let's read um, just a page or so of the first subsection, if I can get someone to read from there. I can read if we don't have anybody. Yeah, can go you ahead. hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. C, right? C? Yes, exactly. Right. Intra, intraperceptual image in the perception of shapes, geometrical images. One, subjective control. An associated image. The existence of intraperceptual images was discovered during the studies of uh, the visual perception of shapes, particularly by Schumann in the experiment of subjective control. See the course of uh, perception in the May 1965 Bulletin de Psychology. Ah, Bulletin de Psychology. Uh, to designate this category of perceptual phenomena, Woodworth uses the expression of quotes attached the image on quotes, connoting a purely central origin. The central psychological and non-peripheral effects that act as a power of modification of the dimensions and relations of perceptual subsets do indeed correspond to the dynamic theory of ellipse. 1897, which calls such an introduction of a tendency into the perceived object's influence, empathy, a tendency felt by the subject in the presence of the spectacle of the world and introduced into objects where it generates enlargement, narrowing, elevation, contraction, or expansion of one of the parts relative to the others. The object is modified in perceptual representation in a manner that conforms to a tendency implicitly introduced by the subject. Architects who build a large monument, temples, theaters, correct. At the outset, outset lines, 
spacings and dimensions so that the deformations induced by the subject are harmoniously compensated for. It is for this, this reason that the columns in temples are neither parallel nor equally spaced out, and that large horizon, hor horizontal layout displays a certain curvature that compensates and advance the perceptual deformation that might make them look awkward. According to Lips, a standalone square, when inserted into a vertical position of uh, rectangles and squares, where it appears to be supporting the weight of the whole edifice, displays a deformation that exaggerates its vertical dimension so that it will appear as a rectangle when seen in the position of, the, of a stone supporting a great weight. According to Einfelon theory, this effect rejects from the vertical force of elastic reaction the subject imagines within the stone. If the perceptual deformations are caused by the introduction of imaginary forces in the configuration of objects, rather than from properly optical geometrical effects, there must exist a difference between perceptual illusions produced with the non-signifying material and those produced with the signifying material having the same geometrical properties. This is how Kogendorf Dwarf illusion was shown in the signifying version of villainy within a deco of ruins of a particular, a particular band with parallel edges becomes a body body of an ancient column, while an inter intercepted oblique becomes a rope between two devils. Alien Virupil has also com compared the different montage montages of the Pogendorf illusion in both the signifying and non-signifying versions. There are two, the oblique becomes a rope or cable tends to on a pulley by a worker lifting up a, lifting up a bag. Behrung has proposed that this configuration, configuration be staged out not only in a signifying set, but in one that is concrete and real, for example, the man drawing water from a well with a cord going be behind, behind the plank. Indeed, it is in this direction that research should be oriented in order to detect and uh, measure precisely, objectively, the influence of present imagination on perception. And a large number of experiments on geometric uh, representations or re realist miniature models, there is a change in the order of magnitudes of the perceived objects when going from the non-signifying version, a uh, coat, with the painting on a canvas, unquote, the, the, to the signifying version, a graphic symbol of a large scale, actualities like as a monument or a human being. It is difficult in such, a, such cases to avoid the interferences coming from the perceptual adaptation to the scale of the perceived phenomenon. Pers uh, perspective effects representation of the situated corporeal schema, etc. In order to conduct conclusive experiments on these effects of intraperceptual images, the non-signifying geometrical figures must have the same size as the real signifying figures, that is to say, that of the doors, barriers, and columns that constitute the signifying elements, we might be able to show that the effects of Einflum are neither exceptional nor rare, and that there exists, if not an implicit animism, at least a latent organicism in perception that posits tensions, forces, res resistances, and actions in the shape of things. Continue. Uh, let's stop. <clears throat> let's stop here. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, right. So, yeah. So we're looking now at perception of shapes and um, Simon Dong, the, the sort of general uh, argument of this section um, is, uh, is one that he's developed in a few other places that we've seen in, in other readings, um, namely that the perception of shapes is not governed by a sort of um, um, equilibrium state. So we don't perceive a good shape as one that is the most probable or that has the least tension or, or something along those lines, which is what certain um, Gestalt psychologist had argued, uh, and and so some of these um, 
sort of principles of perception, this Einfühlung that he talks about here, um, uh, have to do with the perception of shapes as physical objects um, and the way that physical objects are governed by different forces. So he talks about how if you have a square with um, something bigger on it, uh, a big, I don't know, circle or rectangle, whatever, on top of the square, then the square looks like it's sort of compressed vertically. It, it, you, you see it as if it were a rectangle that's being squished by something on top of it. Um, I was trying to find a, an image of that, but I can't find one uh, quickly here. But um, uh, these uh, sort of perceptual um, illusions that, that, you, that you come across, or, or certain types of perceptual illusions, uh, have to do with the way that we perceive objects as parts of a of a situation in which they're being acted on by different forces. Um, and uh, what he, this notion of Einfühlung, what he uses here um, of this notion is that uh, we perceive these objects, we, we sort of grasp the form or the shape, not just by sort of um, tracing the outline in a sort of speculative sense, um, just sort of looking at the outline of the shape and then grasping this is a square, this is a, a triangle, whatever. Um, we instead sort of imagine ourselves into the shape and we think of, um, we sort of grasp the, the structure of a shape or a group of shapes by imagining, you know, what we would do to sort of bring about this, this structure. Uh, so we think of like a line, not just as a straight line drawn on a page, but as a cord being pulled tight. Um, so we, we see different shapes um, as we, we sort of grasp the, the structure of these shapes by sort of imagining ourselves into this situation in which the shape would be produced. And so he talks about, you know, some of these types of optical illusions. You can, um, you can bring them about not just by drawing lines on a page, but you can actually um, make a physical setup, like, you know, using cords and, um, I don't know, cardboard cutouts or whatever. Uh, and you can actually have a, an object in the environment that sort of reproduces the optical illusion. And um, I don't think this has really been studied in a lot of detail, but he talks about or he suggests that you might um, you might perceive some of these optical illusions differently or the effect might be different if um, if the object is perceived as a real object and not just as a set of lines on a page. Um, and uh, so he talks about how this uh, Poggendorf illusion, um, so I, I put a, a link in the chat here too. So this uh, illusion is uh, you have a line with a, like a rectangle or some, some other shape over it that blocks it. Um, and the line, so the line is broken. Uh, and then you have a second line um, uh, that only, only on one side of the rectangle or the occluding shape and the uh, the line looks like it's actually connected to the second line as opposed to the first line that it's really connected to. Um, it's hard to sort of uh, describe it verbally, but if you just search for that name, Poggendorf illusion, you'll find a, a picture of it. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, he mentions a, a study that looked at this illusion um, drawn just on, on a page and then um, reproduced as a, an image of, uh, of real objects. And um, um, I believe, what does he say here? Yeah, the, the one, um, the signifying version, so the version in which it has real objects um, arranged in this form uh, looks larger than the, um, the uh, just drawn version. Um, as he, so he suggests that this, um, that this is sort of a, a direction of research that psychology should pursue, that you, we should be looking at optical illusions, not just as shapes drawn on a page, but uh, in terms of real images of objects. Um, and I don't think that has really been done that much, or at least I, I don't know of research on that, um, uh, going down that, that path uh, since the time Simon Dong wrote this in the late 60s. I'm not sure it can be uh, related to this pop, uh, uh Gulliver's travels, like the 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 stories, like the when the Gulliver went to the uh, the giant giant country, whatever, and then he was a, a mini person there, 
But when he went to the Lilliput, right, and the small people's country, he was a big guy, something like that. So kind of like the the size, the image and everything, maybe very relational and related to the uh, its environment or surroundings, something like that. Could it, could it have to do with this one? Um, hmm. I'm not sure there's a, a direct connection um, because I think what Simon Dong is pointing to here is is not just... Uh, so yeah, you're right that um, our perception of size, of course, is relative to um, an environment. So um, something that looks big. And so he talked about uh, in, in the reading we did last week, he talked about um, the chimney seen on a on a roof looks sort of normal size but then when you bring it inside the house and, and leave it in the staircase it looks huge and and sort of uh protruding um uh so yeah we have this sort of um relativity of of perception to context um um but what he's pointing to here is not just that relativity but um rather the uh perception of objects as sort of endowed with forces in a situation so when we see just lines drawn on a page, they have the sort of abstract quality. Um, they, we, we, to some extent, we see them as objects, uh, but because they're so um, simple and they lack details and you know shading and all the different things that we perceive in real objects, um, these sort of simple geometrical figures drawn on a page, um, they have a, a very sort of minimal sort of uh, structure to them. Whereas when we see real objects, um, we perceive them as uh, having these sort of forces inherent in them. That we, we see them as we see a um, we we see a rope, for example, as being stretched tight. We we can sort of perceive the tension of the rope, um, even if you know there, we don't uh, you know know exactly what the rope is uh, connected to. We just see the rope and we we sort of feel the tension. Um, and uh, and so when we perceive real situations of objects, we we perceive not just like geometrical shapes, but we perceive the actual configuration, the dynamical configuration, all the different forces that are acting on these objects. And um, and so that's I think that's the the point of this section is that we we really perceive uh, objects as endowed with forces and having these dynamical properties, and not just as sort of abstract geometrical figures. Oh yeah, thank you. Like taking to that that part, then, uh, then then kind of a psychological uh, variable could affect kind of this kind of um, perceiving perception of image at the same time. For example, if I like rectangle, I would like I mean, simply to put uh, it simply, then I can like uh, perceive or rectangle some kind of particular objects bigger than the other one, something like that, like a psychological variable, psychological influence, like, psych, how do I say, like, psychological element, like... Yeah, I think I think I understand what you're getting at. Yeah, so um, this notion of Einfühlung um, that that um, Simon Dong is drawing from Lips, um, it, uh, so he mentions that it's a, the, the sort of proposal, uh, the idea of this notion is that it's a central influence on perception. So it's it's not something that is sort of built into our perceptual apparatus. It's something that um, has to do with our um, sort of conceptual grasp of a situation and our our um, emotional state and so on. So we like like in the example of the rope, we, we perceive the rope as tense by sort of imagining ourselves into the rope. We We sort of like picture or sort of uh, grasp what it would feel like to be the rope, to be stretched out like that. Um, and of course, this is something that would uh, vary depending on your degree of, um, I guess, identification with the object. So, I mean, the rope is, it's, uh, to, some, to some extent, it's, it's a little bit difficult to sort of, to, I guess, imagine yourself into the rope. Um, because a rope is a very different type of object than a human body, but um, like perceiving a human shape in a particular posture, for example, um, you it's much easier to imagine yourself into that shape. You can sort of uh, you know ma mirror your body onto the uh, body that you perceive in the uh, in the image. Um, so. Uh, and then again, it would also depend on like your emotional state. And like you might have um, 
some emotional states where it's it's much easier for you to um, um, to sort of imagine yourself into an object and then other states you might be more sort of closed off to the object and not perceive them as having this dynamical property um, so yeah the, this type of perception and you can think of like perceiving artworks for example like you have to sort of get yourself into the right mindset i guess to um experience an artwork and uh you know really sort of get yourself into this artwork um a painting or a sculpture or whatever um you have to be in the right mental state the right mood and so on to uh to really experience the artwork um so yeah this kind of perception is uh is very dependent on your overall like psychological condition and and what state you're in i did thank you yeah, and Angus has posted in the chat here a link to uh, something about Japanese folklore about objects that uh, come to life after they get after they reach a hundred years old. I think is is that how it works? I think so. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think it's a hundred years old and then they become a kind of monster. I'm not sure why, but the art is cool. So I guess the moral of the story is don't let your objects get to be a hundred years old. Like replace your your um, household tools and so on before they get that old. Right, throw your broom away before it starts dancing around. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go on to the next bit. Uh, so if I can get a volunteer to read from the bottom of eighty-two, we might indeed um, up to the subsection break. I can read again. <clears throat> we might indeed be able to summarize the phenomena of subjective contours as well as those of ein for lung by saying that the subject of perception is prone to capturing within the configurations of reality subsets having not only uh, not only the average size of the human organism but also the basic properties of all organisms that is the capacity of locomotion polarity and the orientation of movements and of the body schema perceptual groupings do not proceed from chance nor as a result of symmetries and geometrical equilibria. A contour delineates a subset that might be a living organism, moving as a whole, oriented as a whole in the same direction. There are no subjective contours when the details to be gathered do not exist or are not manifest. Contrary to the common error of amateurs of photographic techniques using broad, violent, and contrasted compositions, it is not simply the black-white opposition that cuts out regions within a whole. There has to be precision, a nuancing in the shot so that sets can detach themselves, a totalitarian art of violent oppositions, annihilating details through sharp contrast, developing through sharp contrast developing and printing creates the impression of a Chinese ink drawing, but does not really generate the effect of the composition of reality. A contour is the active frontier of a population of elements, a republic of details. It has a functional meaning like the tegument of an organism in relation to the organs it covers up and whose coordinated plurality it makes manifest. The Einfelon may be assimilated to those effects of seizing organized and organic subsets as intermediaries between the elementary order of microstructures and the order of configurations of the whole. To perceive a rope as straight because it is pulled by a force means to place oneself as an organism in the place of this rope, to make the rope an extension of the arm, or to imagine it as the body stretching out through the effort of tension, elongating as it lifts a burden. The order of magnitude of contours and attached images is the same as that through which the common effects of Einfelung reveal themselves because it corresponds to one of the most primary categories of perception, the encounter with living retorts to the subject in the universe. Similar groupings in organic units are possible with sounds, for example, in white noise, which because of its random character offers multiple opportunities of subjective structuring. This is, uh, this is an interesting idea that there is a tendency to perceive objects or to group objects or just for perception in general to be uh to have an organic structure um, and at least part of the emphasis is on something like a membrane that uh 
groups one set of objects in a perceptual field um, and distinguishes them from others. Uh, I think that, you know, the idea of the, the membrane is, or the, the, the relational limit is obviously very important for Simon Don in the form of the crystal crystallizing and as well as things like the cell wall and the in-group, out-group distinction from psychic and collective individuation. Yeah, this bit is interesting. Uh, yeah, all those um, connections you mentioned are are important. Um, <laughs> there's also um, some interesting other things that have come up sort of since the time that Simon Don wrote. So uh, I'm going to put a link here to um, people might be familiar with the game of life, um, which is um, uh, a sort of mathematical game invented by uh, John Conway, um, where you just take um, a grid uh, and, and more generally, this is known as a, a cellular automaton um, uh, sort of process. But you take a grid um, and you have some uh, like active cells on the grid or filled cells, uh, and then the rest are empty. And you have a set of rules that say, like, if one neighbor of a cell is is full, then that cell turns full. Uh, but if, like, say, three neighbors are full, then uh, that cell turns empty and so on. You have the like, rules that transform one state of the grid to another state. Um, and what happens if you just draw sort of random shapes or, or you, you sort of um, uh, fill in a few cells in, in this grid and then you start it running and you let it go for a while, you eventually start to see shapes that look like um, living organisms. Like they, you, they sort of move across the grid and they like one looks like it eats another one and and they uh, or sometimes they look like they split and sort of reproduce and and so on so they you perceive these sort of very abstract um you know grid configurations as if they were living organisms uh and uh so it, it, it there's some you know debate about uh you know to the extent you know what what to what extent is this perception an illusion is it just sort of our um perceptual uh, makeup that makes us perceive things as organisms, or is there some sort of real structure to this game that, uh, in some sense, uh, mirrors or re reflects um, the structure of actual living or organisms? Uh, and I think that, I mean, it, hmm, the answer to that question is uh, sort of independent of what Simon Don is talking about here, but we at least, um, you know, either way, we, we have this capacity um, or this... Um, tendency in our perception to uh to perceive things as living objects even though like in this case they're very simple um sort of configurations of a grid that are um are quite different than like real living organisms um so i think that's a, a sort of an interesting illustration of this uh of this principle um and again the, the sort of moral that we can draw from this section is that um our perceptual apparatus is not oriented towards simple geometrical figures and the most probable um, uh, sort of arrangement of shapes in in a, a setting. Uh, we're instead oriented towards detecting um, uh, living beings, uh, and you know, evolutionarily, this makes a lot of sense. That uh, uh, you know, our perceptual apparatus is the result of many millions of years of evolution of organisms that. Um, had to detect uh, potential prey, potential predators, potential mates, and so on in an, an environment. So, the, so being able to perceive uh, um, a shape as being, you know, a, another organism that has these p potential um, uh, affordances to it, um, I think that is more plausible as a sort of function for perception than, uh, you know, perceiving triangles and rectangles, which, you know, in uh, before human beings started making them, were relatively rare objects in uh, in the world. So uh, evolutionarily, it makes sense that we would perceive objects as you know these bounded um, organisms, as opposed to perceiving objects as geometrical shapes. Uh, or at least the sort of organic perception would be more fundamental to our perceptual system than uh, perceiving geometrical figures. Uh, and the other bit that um, I was going to mention here is there's another text uh, from Simon Don um, where he he discusses um, a set of 
psychological experiments that he did um, is, is kind of a strange. So in, in psychology, there's a, a longstanding um, use of an instrument called a tachistoscope where you um, you present images very quickly to a subject and you sort of get them to um, describe what they see or to try to make differentiations that in an image that they see very quickly and so on. Um, and the idea is to try to get, uh, try to extract the sort of most basic perceptual process from uh, and, and separate it out from like more elaborate perceptual performances. So you want to see, like, is it possible to detect color in an image that you only perceive for a fraction of a second, for example? Um, but what Simon Don did is sort of the opposite of that. He he instead had very long perceptions of an image, and he wanted to see what exactly, um, what would you perceive if you just sort of stare at a shape um, for 20 minutes or or 40 minutes or whatever. Um, and he so what he did, um, I mean, I won't go through the whole uh, set of experiments, but he, he would have like a, a shape of some kind um, being projected onto a screen, um, and then the, the shape was rotating. Uh, so you would see, uh, on the screen, you would see a, a shadow of the shape um, sort of moving through time, uh, moving across the screen and in a rhythmic pattern as the shape rotates. Um, and he, um, the way he describes it is that after many minutes of looking at this uh, sort of changing shadow on the screen, you, you start to perceive it as an organism. You start to see it as like not just um, an alternating set of shadows, but instead you start to see like uh, the organism breathing, for example, you know, breathing in and expanding and then breathing out and contracting. Um, so you, you start to perceive this um, sort of contour of shadow on a screen as if it's the uh, membrane of an organism that is expanding and contracting. Uh, so I think that's another uh, type of um, example of this organic nature of perception. Uh, again, a very simple and abstract sort of uh, shape perceived on a screen. Uh, you know, the longer you look at it, the more it starts to look like an organism as opposed to just a, a, a shape on a screen. So uh, I think that's another sort of confirmation of uh, Simon Don's point here. Okay, so let's go on to the next subsection. <clears throat> uh, can I get a volunteer to read from the bottom of 83, the subsection, you can read the full subsection too. Mm, there's not a lot of volunteers today. Everyone's uh, I don't know, recovering from last night or something. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read this section uh, and then hopefully someone else can uh, pick up the next one. Okay, subsection two, reversibilities. A second important argument in favor of the metastable character of perceptual equilibria is the existence of reversibilities. The effects of reversibility would not be conceivable if we presumed that definitive perception corresponds to the most probable state to the minimum of potential energy of the system, thus to a degraded state. If reversibility is implying spontaneous changes during perception as it is prolonged may appear, it is because potentialization continues to be accomplished during perception itself. In other words, the regime of perception comprising reversible configurations is formally similar to that of a switch, switching on its own when the condenser governing the inactive element reaches the difference of potential needed for that element to become a conductor. Reversibilities are especially evident for geometrical figures that can be seen in spatial perspectives, such as Schroeder's stairs. Since there is no vanishing point, the subjective viewpoint is alternatively above and below the stairs. When perceptual toggling occurs, a sudden leap flips from one configuration to the other. The same phenomenon takes place with Rubin's cross, made of two imbricated Maltese crosses, one with arc circles, the other with spokes. When one acts as figure, the other becomes ground and seems to extend underneath the figure. Inversions occur spontaneously, but may also be induced by willful attention, at least to some extent, which shows that the figure-ground equilibrium is not akin to a stable equilibrium. What might correspond here to a stable equilibrium would be the degraded state of a disorderly configuration in which various possible types of perceptual configurations would simultaneously mix together by superimposition. Uh, so here he's again um, arguing against the idea that uh, perception consists in finding the, the most probable or the most stable configuration in a, a sort of uh, environment. Um, and he talks, his, his argument here has to do with reversibility. So these types of um, um, optical illusions like uh, the stairs, um, you know, many of us, I think, probably have seen this. Um, there's a a drawing of stairs that you can either see it as, um, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Angus. Um, so you can see the stairs as if you're looking at them from above uh, and to the left, like you're, you're left of the stairs and looking 
uh, looking at them from above, or you can see them as the bottom of the stairs uh, where you're standing on the right of the stairs. Um, and uh, so if you just sort of stare at this drawing long enough, you eventually start to sort of switch back and forth. You, you see one for a few seconds, and then you see the other for a few seconds. And, and uh, so it's clear that in this situation, you're not actually sort of reaching a, sta a stable state and uh, your perceptual apparatus doesn't sort of reach one configuration and stay there. Instead, you reach one state for a while, and then there's a sort of, it's as if there's a sort of buildup of tension or buildup of charge or something uh, that makes you switch to the other state. And then again, this, uh, the process restarts, and then the, the buildup occurs again until you reach the, the switch points, and then you go back to the first state. Um, and you can also, to some extent, uh, sort of, uh, make yourself see the other shape so you can sort of direct your attention in such a way that you actually perceive uh, one configuration versus the other one. Um, so again, this, this sort of shows that your perceptual apparatus is not oriented towards um, one stable configuration, but it, at least in these phenomena, there are two metastable configurations that each can switch into the other. Um, so again, this is part of the argument uh, showing that um, that perception um, doesn't sort of lead us towards a single uh, most stable configuration, as certain Gestalt psychologists had argued. You know, I was trying to find an image of that cross, um, but uh, um, yeah, I can't find one quickly here. But um, yeah, there's um, a drawing of a of a cross um, where, or a, a pair of crosses, I guess, where you see. Um, you can see either one, like a, a black cross on a white background or a white cross on a black background. Uh, and you can sort of flip back and forth between these two perceptions in the same way it's with the stairs. Um, so that's another example of this kind of, uh, yeah, these are sort of similar. Uh, I don't think that's exactly the one that Simona was talking about. Um, these are with squares. The other one was, is with a circle, I think. Um, but it's a similar type of phenomenon. So you can see these... Um, you can see these shapes either either as a, a white shape on a, a black surface or a, a black shape on a white surface. Uh, you can sort of uh, invert your perception either way. You can you can see either one. Um, so uh, yeah, these are examples of metastable states in perception where you can reach a certain state that is temporarily stable, but then it it flips over into the other one uh, either spontaneously or um, through an act of attention. But th this one, like particularly like the Maltese cross, a uh, Rubens cross, actually this kind of like the image, like sometimes you used to, to identify like one's uh, state of mind, like or psychological state, something like that, or like the characteristic, characteristic or characters. I mean, when we like uh, talk about like, uh, or you you are like an introvert or uh, or extrovert or whatever, sometimes uh, this kind of image you used to so. In this kind of thing, like I, my, I, I'm just wondering, like, oh, then what the truth is, like, what, what is the true image is, like, cause, like, uh, in the case of this kind of like Lubin's cross, Maltese crosses, actually, it could be, it could be, it could be both, like, it could be like, um, um, both, both images. So at the same time, also like the, I'm thinking of the the movie, like the film by Kurosawa Akira's, like Rashomon. Actually, that's not the image, but the, that is about the one kind of um, event or occasion. And then about that, I mean, for people's like uh, the memory is all different. So likewise, um, kind of my question here is that like, then what is a true image? It's like, a, what is a true image of non-object is? Right. I think um, I think part of what Simon Don, the sort of general... Um, concept of the image that Simon Don was developing throughout this text is that an image is always complementary to a subject. Um, so um, we, we always have uh, an image that uh, an image and a subject always go together. Uh, so it, we, we can't really ask what is the true image. Um, we always have to ask which image is sort of um, uh, accompanied by which subject or which subject and image go together. Um, so in the case of the, these sort of reversible illusions or these reversible images where you can see the stairs either 
from above or from below, the, we have a, an image and a subject that are sort of alternating together. Um, uh, I mean, the drawing is, is, neither, uh, is neither stairs from above nor from below. Uh, it's, it's really just a set of lines on a page um, um, or on a computer screen or whatever. Uh, but um, it's the subject and the image that sort of vary in coordination with each other. So the subject is, is undergoing some sort of transformation, and then the image um, that the subject perceives is also flipping back and forth between these two states. Uh, so I think, I think we, in general, have to think of the image as always um, coordinate to a subject, uh, and um, yeah, as opposed to something that has a, a kind of extra subjective reality or that, um, um, that would be independent of a subject. So what if, what if like the blind, I mean, perceives the, the objects like as, as like uh, written in the Raymond Carver's like the novel, I mean, short story like the ca uh, cathedral, like, cause like uh, this kind of image uh, are related to the vision, like, cause like uh, the default, like the pro uh, primary idea is like everybody has eyes, like uh, visions. But definitely, what if what if the blind like uh, perceives uh, the objects, and then that could be totally different kind of image. I don't know. Maybe that's almost much much more much more closer closer to the actual actual image of the objects. Yeah, I think uh, so. A lot of these examples have to do with visual perception because um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, visual perception in most human beings is is sort of the richest sense in this in the sense that it provides the most. Um, detail and the most differentiation of objects um but there are also illusions that you, there are um auditory illusions um i forget what it's called now but there's a um there's a an illusion that you can develop where it, um you have a, a pitch that sounds like it's constantly getting higher um you you essentially have a cycle where you have a high you have one pitch that is increasing in uh in or you have one tone that increases in pitch um, and then you have another tone um, that is also increasing in pitch uh, that starts out lower. Um, it's hard to describe in words, but you you the illusion is that you you constantly it, it constantly sounds like the tone is increasing in pitch, even though of course in reality um, a tone that is increasing in pitch eventually will reach the limits of your perceptual range. Um, uh, so this is an auditory illusion. Um, I think there are other other phenomena that you could describe as auditory illusions. Um, but um, so some of these phenomena that Simon Don describes using visual illusions, we might be able to um, find equivalent illusions in other sense modalities. But um, yeah, it's it's obviously easiest to find them in the case of visual uh, perception. Um, but uh, I think in general, I mean, Simon Don doesn't talk about it a lot, but we can talk about images in a sort of extended sense, we can think of auditory images or tactile images. Um, um, you know, these sort of image phenomena that he's talking about are not restricted to visual sense, I don't think. I think we can um, uh, extrapolate a little bit and, and include other uh, forms of sense uh, as having images that would behave in similar ways as visual images, though, of course, there would be, you know, differences in, in the specifics. I, I found uh, one image of Lashomong effect, like the um, but I think like a um, visual, visual perception or tactical, like a by touching, like also like it could be, I mean the the image by like uh, the um, how do I say by touching also can be like a just like a expresses a part of the the object as well. Uh, the the image in my, for my part like image is not like uploaded uploaded like. But the, the 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 image I got the, from the Google, like the by putting like a rational effect. But the, there is an elephant, and the people are touching the elephant, and then every everyone has a, a different kind of image of an elephant, something like that. Right. There's a, a famous um, um, sort of parable of um, you know a bunch of people all sort of describing uh, an elephant, um, but they each sort of um, yeah they each are perceiving a different part of the elephants and they each um they each describe uh you know what an elephant is in terms of the part they perceive yeah uh that's uh the image that you just posted is a, a sort of example of that yeah so you um 
Is it working? Yes. Yeah, I see it. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. I mean, this this is, um, I guess, a slightly different phenomenon in the sense that um, this involves like extrapolation from a part to the whole. Um, so this would be like you know you perceive a part of uh, the elephant, and then you you say the elephant is like um, a wall or like a snake or whatever. Um, you you are perceiving only one element of the of the the whole, and then you sort of um, conclude to what the whole of the the object is. Um, but uh, yeah, I think so. Maybe an example of uh, a tactile type of illusion, or a, a, I mean, it's not even an illusion so much, but like. If you proceed, if you stick your hand in cold water, it, you stick one hand in cold water and the other hand in hot water, and then you you put both hands in lukewarm water, then one hand will perceive the water as hot, as as warm ish, and then the other hand will perceive it as cold. Um, so the exact same water, you um, you um, you perceive it differently depending on which hand you uh, sort of pay attention to, um, uh, and then you. Um, uh, yeah, so this this is a sort of um, illusion of um, temperature perception in your in your hands, uh, as opposed to like a visual illusion. Um, but um, yeah, so you can find different illusions that uh, appear in different sense modalities that I think um, would probably give us similar types of um, structure to perception as we have in visual perception. It's just that the other senses tend to be um, less rich in detail than visual perception. So it, um, maybe it would be harder to find um, good examples of each of these phenomena. Right, sure. Mm. It's kind of a minor comment, but I wonder if, uh, if multi-stability for Simon Don is just reversible metastability. Because they're, like, they're obviously... Um, relative metastabilities for Simondon that are not reversible in this way, like, uh, or in which, in which one metastable resolution, one, I'm thinking of the relatively metastable allotropes of sulfur that he talked about in volume one, where one allotrope is more stable than the other. And if, if the relatively metastable allotrope, uh, changes to the more stable allotrope, then that process is not reversible. And so, um, yeah, I guess the multi-stability would be metastability that doesn't actually, well, I guess it just has a reversible stabilization. Yeah, so metastability in general is not reversible. Um, as, so in the example that you mentioned, um, we have sulfur that can crystallize in uh, at least two different shapes, um, possibly more, I can't remember. Um, but um, there's a, a sort of ordering of the crystallization uh, um, possibilities of sulfur and of other substances. So if it crystallizes in one form, then it, uh, like say, we'll call it form A, it crystallizes in form A, and then uh, it comes into contact with a crystal of form B, then all the crystals of form A will turn into crystals of form B. Um, whereas uh, crystal of form B, if it comes into contact with the crystal of form A, will not change. So A is less stable than B. Um, uh, and so you have uh, an ordering of the different um, states of crystallization of sulfur. Um, whereas in the case of the um, stair illusion or the Maltese cross illusion, uh, or these ambiguous figures, maybe they're not illusions, but um, these ambiguous figures, um, these have no ordering so you can pass from one direction to the other and neither one is more stable than the other um and so the the sort of metaphor that simon Dong uses or the analogy simon Dong is drawing here is with a, a kind of switching apparatus that would um involve uh sort of a, a buildup of tension or charge or uh potential of some kind um so you have state a and then you have a buildup a gradual buildup of uh you know charge or whatever you want to call it uh, and then once it reaches the thresholds, it flips the whole mechanism over to state B. Um, and then you have, again, a buildup of charge. And then when, it's, when it reaches the threshold, it flips back to state A. Um, so you can think of, like, I, I think he talks about um, the example of um, 
geyser is like old faithful um in somewhere in the u.s i forget where exactly but um the, these geysers have um a regular recurrence pattern where you have um a, a gradual buildup of pressure in a in a cavity of some kind and then once it reaches a certain state it um uh releases that pressure through a, a sort of geyser eruption um and then that uh pressure starts to build up again and then it it releases again uh, in a regular recurring pattern. Uh, you know, there's a you can um, sort of you can predict the eruptions um, based on the uh, you know length of time. That there's a predictable time period between eruptions. Um, so uh, yeah, these these are the types of um, phenomena that he's thinking of as like the analogy that he that he's drawing here. So we can pass from one state to the next just in terms of sort of flipping. Uh, the mechanism from one side to the other when the tension or the potential builds up to a certain level. Um, so yeah, neither state is more stable than the other. It's just the 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 whole reg the whole pattern, I guess, of switching back and forth is stable um, as opposed to any one state of the of the pattern. Okay, uh, so let's go on to subsection three. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, if I could get someone to read up to the the sub subsection break, the the heading A. Um, so read from subsection three up to the heading A. Uh, if I can get a volunteer, I can read uh, again. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I can, I can give you a no break. I, I, uh, yeah, I can give yeah, you a yeah, break, Ollie, Ollie, I think you Ollie, just go ahead. Had... Uh, oh, go ahead, okay. Ollie. Yeah. Thank you. To read the image as a singularity or privileged system of perceptual compatibil compatibility among all this of magnitude. It is possible to restore a meaning to the principle of isomorphism of a gestalt psychology by applying it to the intermediary level, the middle order of magnitude to perceive the realities. What constitutes the image, fair image, in, in a perceptual whole is neither microstructures nor all configurations, as perfect and geometrical as they may be. But the always uh, precarious and tense correspondence or compatibility between the molecular and solar order of realities. Hence, the good quotes, good form, unquote, a business corresponds to a rare, pre precious system of compatibility between the individual honeycombs and the row grouping them, partly due to the hexagonal structure and partly to the back to back imbrication of cells sharing a common wall, common wall is the formula for the maximum of capacity and solidity with the minimum of wax. It's a matter of equilibrium in a certain sense, yet a kind of particular and rare equilibrium that human inventions realize or the compatibilities of organs in a living body or, again, works of art that institute a harmony between the, the structures of each of the elements and that of the whole. This equilibrium obtained against uh, that the threat of disorder and chaos is clearly not the same as that which at the end of a leveling of all oscill oscillations through the degre degradation of energy produces the flat and horizontal surface of water or the spherical surface of a drop suspended in an estonic, estonic liquid. What, however, connects such structures of stable state systems to pregnant forms, such as a straight line or a sphere, is that under certain aspects, they attain dimensional minima, like the straight line that is the shortest, shortest line between two points, or the sphere that is the smallest surface enveloping a given volume. Such minima become optimal, that is the system so whose energy is degraded, but when considers, considered as a solution to a problem, thus when instead of being the formula for the whole system, there are means, subsets seemingly playing the role of mediators, mediators and intermediaries between a larger configurations and an elementary meta. The spherical form is a good form when it is, uh, it is an intermediary structure such as a cistern, cistern or balloon. The thin glass of protecting a filament for, from the action of the atmosphere or 
a submersible enveloping a universe amidst 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 another universe as a functional system of a compatibility between two milieus embedded on one the other. The case of geometrical figures as pregnant images, therefore, does not mean that pregnancy is attached to stable equilibrium states or to the most likely shapes according to chance. For there are cases when geometrical shapes are solutions of exception to the problem of maxima and minima posed by the relation between two orders of magnitude of reality. This is it, right? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, again, we're looking at this notion of good form from Gestalt psychology. And um, so the idea of this bit, again, is to, um, to um, differentiate good form from simple geometrical figures. And so there are instances, of course, where certain geometrical figures are good form. So he talks about the beehive, for example, the hexagonal shape of, um, of the, the cells in a, a beehive. Um, and he talks about the, uh, the diver's suit with the, the bubble um, for the, uh, um, yeah, the uh, bubble where the, the head is, for example. Um, but these are sort of exceptional. And, and what he takes to be characteristic of a good form is that it mediates between two different levels of reality or orders of magnitude. Um, so he talks about the molecular and the solar level. Um, and uh, this might be an allusion to something that he talks about briefly in the introduction to uh, individuation, which is the way that plants, for example, um, mediate between molecular and sort of cosmic levels. Um, so they take in radiation from the sun, energy from the sun, um, and they use it to perform um, chemical transformations of, you know, forming carbohydrates. Um, and, and so this, the plant is a, a sort of intermediate reality. The, the level of the organism is, is a sort of mediation between this cosmic level of solar radiation and uh, the molecular level of, uh, you know, forming carbohydrates. Uh, so, um, yeah, th this is sort of, he takes this as a, a sort of instance of this general phenomenon of mediation. So good forms are not forms that have this, you know, a simple geometrical uh, property of, you know, minimizing surface area or something like that. Good forms are the forms that perform this act of mediation between different orders of magnitude. Uh, and so some of the um, um, technical objects that he mentions here, um, they might happen to have a simple geometrical form, but it's because they play a role. Uh, they, it, it's not because they have this simple geometrical form that they are good forms. It's because they play a role in mediating between different orders of magnitude that they, um, that they are good forms. Uh, and so we'll see more examples of that in the next couple of sections. Does it mean like um, in, inside of the cosmos, there is a chaos? Like what I mean is like uh, here, pregnant images, like apparently like a honeycomb looks like a harmonious kind of image, but inside the harmonious image, there could be some kind of chaotic or unbalanced uh, image is possible, something like that. Um, so I think he doesn't he doesn't specifically talk about this concept of chaos, but he talks about um, probability, uh, and and we'll see in a in the next couple of sections he's going to talk about you know um, regularity. So when we do perceive a, a simple geometrical shape like a, a circle or a triangle in a in an an environment that um, uh, sort of uh, an uninhabited uh, island, for example, if you suddenly see a circle then you would say, okay, maybe this island is not uninhabited, or maybe someone has visited this island in the past and, you know, built a, a structure, a circular structure of some kind. Um, so you, uh, these simple geometrical shapes um, play the role of, they stand out from the environment because the environment doesn't have any sort of structure to it, or it doesn't have this kind of structure to it. Uh, so um, uh, a sort of background noise like the the environment has a sort of background noise nature to it so it it just has a bunch of different shapes with no sort of discernible structure to it um it so in that sense it's it's like a kind of chaos um or you can think of like white noise for example it's just noise that is has an equal distribution of energy at all frequencies um it uh 
it has no structure to it. And on the background of this white noise, if you suddenly change the distribution of energy at different frequencies, then something will stand out. Um, so uh, it's, it's not exactly chaos, but it's a, a sort of absence of structure as the background on which structures appear. Um, so that's, that's sort of the notion that Simon Dong is using here. Like, like, then we can think of like a swan, like in the like, like somebody says like, um, under the, on the surface, like a swan looks very peaceful and then calm, calm and everything. But in under the water, like lots of movement are going on, something like that. So apparently something, um, harmonious, like actually inside, like a lot of things going on, simply say. Like, um, yeah, so when we talk about these different orders of magnitude, like the beehive, uh, for example, um, part of what makes, so the, the reason or the explanation you can give for why the beehive has this hexagonal structure is that um, the hexagon is the, the shape that sort of um, produces the, that minimizes the amount of wax that you have to use to, um, to produce a tiling of, the, of a surface. Um, so you, you can produce, you can cover a surface with the minimum amount of wax between each of the cells. Um, so there's a sort of dynamical explanation, um, like a, a, a sort of, it's as if there's like a, a force um, uh, drawing the structure towards a minimization of um, amount of wax. It's as if there's like a gravity in the space of possible shapes of, the, uh, of a, a, a tiling of the surface. Um, uh, so yeah, there's like a, a sort of dynamics inherent in these types of regular structures um, that uh, is not apparent from the surface. So at the surface level, when you just look at a honeycomb, it's a it's a sort of static object. It just has a certain structure. Um, but it's only when you sort of uh, study the the types of shapes or the possibility, the the space of possible shapes, that you perceive this dynamics. Uh, this sort of attraction towards this one um, form of uh, this one possible shape as opposed to other possible shapes. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess related to what you were just saying, it's this example of the bee's nest is a bit strange um, to me. He's talking about perception, unless he's saying that, uh, you know, this is an instance of something that appears to be an object of perception that is organized by what a gestalt psychologist would call a good form but in these instances the real um the reason these things are organized this way is because it's the sort of the most efficient way to um affect this compatibility between orders of magnitude yeah i think he so he, he mentions just sort of in passing here this isomorphism principle of gestalt psychology and so this was the idea that um our sort of um, psychological uh, environment, our, the world as we experience it, is um, in some sense isomorphic to the physical structures of the world. And, and in particular, um, our perceptual uh, sort of apparatus reflects the physical uh, forces of, uh, of the world. And so this is, so th they gave sort of um, explanations of, perceptual uh, constancy, or sorry, not perceptual constancy, but um, perceptual significance of good forms, for example, um, that would be parallel to the uh, physical explanations of certain shapes. So um, like the way that a sphere is the, uh, the shape that minimizes the surface area for a given volume. Uh, and so this is why uh, a drop um, of water has a spherical shape in a zero gravity environment. Um, uh, and then the, the sort of teardrop shape that that we perceive is uh, the result of the gravitational um, attraction on this spherical shape. But uh, so a, a, a drop of water has a spherical shape in, in the absence of gravity, um, not because of any sort of uh, imposition of form of a, a sphere onto the matter of, of the water, but instead because that just minimizes the surface tension between the the water and the air surrounding it. Um, and likewise, for the Gestalt psychologists, they would say that the sphere, uh, the perceived sphere, is a good form because it sort of minimizes some perceptual tension or something along those lines. 
And Simon Dome, of course, has argued that um, minimizing tension is not, in fact, the sort of organizing principle of, uh, of perception. Um, but he wants to sort of um, get uh, get at what exactly that isomorphism could still mean. Uh, so there's something correct about this idea that, uh, um, you know, physical structuring forces and perceptual structuring forces have a kind of correspondence to them. And uh, so the beehive example is an instance where um, this uh, structure, this physical structuring principle, the fact that the hexagon is the tiling shape that has the least amount of material for the uh, the cell walls. Um, this physical principle uh, sort of explains why it's a we perceive it as a good shape, um, even though it's not. Uh, it, so it's not actually the hexagonal shape, the uh, simple geometrical form that we perceive as as a good shape. It's the fact that the the beehive is sort of um, uh, mediating between different orders of magnitude instead. That's that's what makes us perceive it as the, the good shape. So it its mediating function um, makes it take on this geometrical, sim, this simple geometrical shape, but it's not because it has the simple geometrical shape that we perceive it as a good form. So what you okay. are... Oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, what you are talking about, like, uh, the I think, like, the Samungdong chose, like, the hexagon is, like, uh, quite smart because... Uh, as far as I remember, uh, some mathematicians uh, mentioned that like a circle is not actually perfectly circle. Um, so, but the what you are saying is like uh, hexagonal. I mean, particular honeycomb is like pragmatically, it kind of a uh, I mean, uh, how do you say minimize uh, like a loss of the honey. So that that's why you think like that's a good form. Uh, it, it could not be like actually really perfect hexagon hexagonal shape, but still. The reason why it is called uh, referred to as a uh, good form is that, like uh, for, for for the bees, it's kind of like a good form because it kind of reduces the the, the amount of uh, the loss of the uh, honey, something like that. Um, right. So yeah, of course, if you look at the hexagons of a bee cell um, um, in in a close enough, like if you measure each side as as you know down to the millimeter. Um, you'll find that they aren't exactly perfect hexagons. Um, there, there's a certain amount of approximation um, uh, in the the development of, uh, or sorry, in the the structure of these shapes. Um, but um, what you um, <clears throat> what you find instead, uh, so the the type of explanation that Simon Dong is talking about here is um, explanations in terms of physical maximization or minimization properties. Uh, so, like the sphere, the spherical shape of the drop of water, or or a soap bubble, maybe is a, a better example for um, sort of everyday perception. So, when you when you blow a bubble of soap, it has a spherical shape. Um, again, it's just uh, through the basic property of minimizing the surface area, the surface tension. Um, it uh, it produces this spherical shape just um, as a result of this simple physical process of minimizing uh, tension. Um, but, um, in perceptual, our, our sort of perception of good forms, uh, Simon Dong argues it doesn't have this property of, um, uh, sort of minimizing tension or minimizing, uh, a particular, uh, quantity in this simple way. Um, so he, he needs to give an alternate account for why something like a beehive, um, has the property of being a good form. And so his explanation is that, um, it's a good form because it mediates between like a, a sort of molecular level and a, a solar level, or at least between different orders of magnitude. Um, uh, so in the case of the beehive, um, we have like the properties of the cell walls. So each wall has a certain structural uh, um, integrity, I guess, or um, it, it has a certain capacity to bear weight. Um, in terms of the molecular bonds between the different molecules of the wall. Uh, and and this property is sort of, uh, is a, a kind of molecular property. It has to do with um, individual relationships between molecules. And then this property is sort of mediated, uh, or, or the, the beehive serves to mediate between this molecular property and the sort of overall geometrical structure of the hive. Um, it, uh, it it produces a shape as a result of the interaction of these 
molecular forces. Um, and, and so um, that's the sort of mediating role of the, the shape of a cell, the hexagon shape of a, a cell in the beehive is, uh, is to mediate between those two levels of reality. And so that's Simon Dong's alternate explanation for why we perceive a, a beehive as a good form. Uh, so it's not because it has a simple geometrical shape, it's because it mediates between different orders of reality. Oh, yeah, thank you. Interesting. And so he's going to give examples in, in later sections where um, you do, um, so when you do perceive a, a simple geometrical shape, um, that's a sort of sign that humans have been around to, you know, produce this shape, uh, you know, simple like circles and uh, squares and rectangles and so on are relatively rare in nature, um, or at least, you know, perfect ones or, or close to perfect ones. Um, and, and so he talks about, he mentions, we'll see this in the next bit, um, he mentions like the so-called fairy circles. Um, so you, you see a circle of uh, mushrooms in, uh, in uh, a forest and it's sort of weird, like it, it, you, you sort of see this circle of mushrooms as something that needs to be explained and, and it's hard to think of it as something, a purely natural phenomenon. Um, and so the, the sort of folklore explanation is that this is where like, witches met uh, in this spot and the mushrooms grew up in, in this circ circular shape because that's where the witches were standing or something along those lines. Um, so uh, uh, any phenomenon that has this regular geometrical shape, we, it, it sort of stands out uh, against this background of uh, the absence of structure. Um, but our, our perception of it as a good form has to do not with the simple geometrical properties of the, the shape, but instead with um, the uh, role of this shape in mediating between different orders of magnitude. Uh, okay, so we're just about at time. Um, maybe we can stop here instead of uh, continuing the rest of this. Um, yeah, so let's stop here at page 85, if that works for everyone. And we'll pick up from here next time. Yeah, that's great. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. Thanks for your contributions and hope to see you next week.